This evening, we're very pleased to host former Bogota Mayor Enrique Peñalosa, who will be speaking with our director, Professor Paul Romer. Um, just a couple of quick notes on the format, and I'll turn it over. Uh, we're handing out three by five cards, and as the conversation up here progresses, if you write down any questions you have on those three by five cards, we'll collect them, and then Paul will use your, your questions to motivate the, the tail end of the uh, conversation tonight. Uh, if you're tweeting, uh, you can mm -hmm. see our, our hashtag up here, Peñalosa Romer. Uh, so please, we encourage you to use that. Um, and that's it for me. So with that, if you'd uh, join me in welcoming Mayor Peñalosa to NYU. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Enrique, for coming to have this conversation. It's a chance for me to learn, maybe, I hope even for you to learn, but we'll, we'll see about that. Um, I wanted to start with the issue that we talked about a, a little bit before that I infer is your primary focus in thinking about cities, which is what you refer to as equality. I've always, try, I've always referred to that as inclusion and wanted to continue that conversation we had about why equality might be the right way to get at the essence of this, this concept and why your sense of equality is not just one of income inequality or equality, but, a, but a, deeper, uh, a, a deeper sense of equality. Yes. I don't know if a deeper one, but a, a possible one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think uh, after communism failed, many people thought that uh, we could forget about equality. This is something uh, of the past, that we should just worry about the efficiency and economic growth, and that uh, we had all this uh, end of history uh, mm -hmm. uh, things. But uh, I think the world has been seeking equality for more than 2,000 years. Greece, Rome, uh, Judeo-Christian, then over the last 300 years, all kinds of wars, revolutions. Uh, millions and millions of people died for equality. Well, in fact, I think what everybody seeks is happiness somehow, regardless, we're not going to go into what that means, but mm -hmm. clearly uh, inequality, feeling inferior or excluded is one of the big obstacles to, to happiness. Uh, and clearly today, we all realize that the best way to manage except for a few people in North Korea, perhaps, or something, most people in the planet realize that the most efficient way to manage most of society's resources <laughs> is private property and the market. So the question, and, and that needs inequality. For the market to work, some people have to make more money, to be richer, some others, uh, some corporations succeed, others fail. So the question is, what kind of equality? What I believe related to cities is that the, the main uh, cause of cities' problems is inequality. Mm -hmm. It is inequality that leads to shopping malls, to gated communities, uh, not to give public transport priority in a road space, not to have quality sidewalks in developing countries, to slums, to have private land and to have slums. So mm -hmm. I would say inequality is the, the cause of most of urban ills. And on the other hand, a city that is well designed can be a very powerful tool for constructing equality. So to oh, go so back to the one, one last sentence is, uh, what kind of equality now we have today? Yeah. I would just propose two very simple kinds of equality. The first article of every constitution in the planet mm -hmm. says that all citizens are equal before the law. This is not just poetry. This is very powerful. If all citizens are equal before the law, mm -hmm. for example, a bus with 100 passengers has a right to 100 times more road space than a car with one. Uh, and uh, that also has a consequence. If all citizens are equal before the law, public good prevails over private interest. This is also explicit in most constitutions, but where it's not explicit, it's implicit. Mm -hmm. If all citizens are equal before the law and public good prevails over private interest, for example, we should not have private waterfronts. I don't think it's very democratic 
to have all these private fancy houses along Long Island Sound, for example. Clearly, because if there was a wonderful public pedestrian waterfront walkway, mm -hmm. millions of people would be happier. Yeah, but so, so it sounds like you're thinking partly about inequality in the sense of political influence and how public investment gets, gets allocated, but then you're also interested in an outcome measure of equality, which, which I take to be something like equality in the public space, that if we somehow distinguish public spaces from private spaces, your house, your private space may be very different than mine, or somebody who's very rich may have a different private space, but in the public space, you want the experience for each individual to be as, as equal as you can, as you can make it. Is well, that a way to... Well, that's part of it. Yeah. Um, clearly, no, let me tell you a story. When I was in Paris as a student, I was extremely poor. Mm -hmm. I lived in a small room with a friend, and then if we unfolded the second bed, we could not walk because the two little bunk beds would fill up the room, but then we had no shower, just a little lavabo, and we would share a toilet with about 20 other similar rooms and things. And but I was extremely happy. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Paris, I had Paris, you know? I had fantastic public transport and parks and sidewalks and museums and lectures and uh, so, uh, so clearly public space is when, when rich and poor meet as equals, mm -hmm. this is a, a very important issue. Rich and poor meet as equals in, uh, public, in parks or in public transport or in cultural events. This is part of it, but this is not, not all of it. Okay. For example, uh, as I mentioned, I think sometimes we have inequality is right before our noses. And we don't see it, for example. Today, when we think of the French Revolution, it seems very obvious, the things that happened there, that changed. But it was not so obvious, because a thousand years had gone by, and nobody had thought there was anything wrong with what was there before. But let's not go back so far. 80 years ago, in this advanced country, African Americans had to give their seats in the buses to whites. Mm -hmm. And the women could not vote. And everybody thought this was normal. You know, it was not bad people or fascists who thought women should not vote. It was a, like a funny thing that to even suggest. So in the same way today, for example, I think that a jam road without exclusive lanes for buses is as flagrant inequality as it was for women not to vote. It's absurd. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't take a PhD from MIT. A, tw a committee of 12-year-old children, <laughs> in 20 minutes, they will realize that the most efficient way to use scarce road space mm -hmm. is with the exclusive lanes for buses. So clearly, to have a jam road without the exclusive lanes for buses shows first technical stupidity mm -hmm. and profound inequality. And then we could go on to other issues of inequality. For example, all developing countries have slums. Mm -hmm. Why there are slums in every developing country? It cannot be because all mayors or presidents are corrupt or dumb, because it's impossible that all mayors and presidents all over the planet are corrupt or dumb. It's clearly the system doesn't work. And uh, the fact is that why there is a lot of land around there, around the cities, very well located land where you could do fantastic cities, well-planned cities, why isn't it done? Because it belongs to a few people who are becoming very rich without doing any work. Mm -hmm. And then this forces the poor people to crazy, inadequate, often dangerous locations. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, well, let's, let's stick with the, the issue of slums for a second. One, one solution that you hear about all the time is an architect who's designed a new low-cost house that they're gonna provide. It's the, it's the, it's the structures. And, you know, our take is that that completely misses the point. The real challenge is the sites, it's the land, it's the scarcity of the, of the land. So it sounds like we, we agree on that. Fully. Uh, then we, we're also talking just, just before we started about the different structure of land ownership in China. Mm -hmm. And you know, China is the one exception where, or one of the few exceptions in the world where you don't see 
uh, large Slum. scale slums or informal uh, informal development. Because so land belongs to government. Yeah. So, uh, of course, there are other reasons <laughs> a little bit, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. but this is basically it, clearly. But this was not just a China uh, invention. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1904, Sweden and Finland, all land around cities was acquired by governments, local governments or partly national governments. Mm -hmm. For example, today, as I was telling you before, as a Latin America, Latin American, well, the same urbanization process which is happening now in Asia between 2000 and 2050, mm -hmm. uh, exactly the same is, happen is happening, uh, happening in Latin America between 1950 and 2000. So the most recent urbanization process that you can see is Latin America. And I would, I would almost like to go on my knees to tell the people in Asia and Africa, which is a little farther behind, to look at the Latin American urbanization process. Not in order to learn from what we did, but to learn what should not be done. For, and for example, if for example, ur rural land reform was very romanticized. People thought rural land reform should be done and all of this, but I think much more important is urban land reform. I believe that if we had bought the land mm -hmm. around cities or a significant portion of land around cities in 1950 in Latin America, it would have cost nothing, peanuts. It would have cost the same as cost a 20 or 30 kilometer subway line, one, I mean, mm -hmm. for the whole country. And this is a 45 million country today. And uh, we would have cities that would be well located. Mm -hmm. They would have great parks. And regardless of the bad planning, it would have been much better than, than we have today. Yeah. So clearly, uh, the market, the market, the market, I mean, I believe in the market. Yeah. But the market does not work in the case of land around growing cities. Because the essence of the market is that when prices go up, supply goes up, and then prices go down. The beauty of the market is that prices tend to approach cost. In the case of land around growing cities, you can increase the price all you want, and the supply of land that is accessible to water, to transport, to jobs, does not increase. So clearly, the market doesn't work. Uh, and this is not only for slums. For example, Mexico just published a wonderful document. What had happened in Mexico between 1980 and 2010? for all Mexican cities. And this is not in case of loan. This is formal development. But it's horrible what has happened because, because of high land prices, low income housing has gone extremely far away from cities. So in average, something like population doubled between 1980 and 2010 in Mexican cities. And the area increased by six and 700%. Yeah. And this is, again, <coughs> because of private property of land, because of a few. But anyway, this is, yeah. Yeah. we have left back a more interesting issue, which is the public pedestrian space, but of course has to do with equality, too. Well, on, on, on your first point, uh, I think that we have not studied cities in anything like the detail and the systematic focus that, that we should. I, my push in coming here to NYU was to say that in, in key junctures in the development of the university, we identified a new unit of analysis and then built a whole line of work around that unit of analysis. So when Harvard invented the business school, the business suddenly became a unit that a whole variety of different academics could come together and study. Uh, very influential, but on a smaller scale, when some chemists at MIT decided to make the plant, the chemical plant, the unit of analysis, they developed chemical engineering, which was incredibly influential in, say, moving the United States to the frontier in the emerging uh, chemical industry. So I've been on this push to get universities to insert the city as a unit of analysis, which is in between the nation state and the business, and to bring the same kind of sy systematic analysis of the city that we bring to something like uh, the, the business. And fortunately, NYU, because I think of its history of 
living in the city and being in and of the city, and also because John Sexton is a kind of a uh, risk-taking entrepreneurial type, um, NYU is, is really committed to this vision, and uh, they're, they're going to make an announcement tomorrow about a, a new university-wide center and a major gift to, to pursue this. So I hope that there will be a co whole community of people who can start to get these general lessons about development from Latin America and then make them available to people who are making these, these kind of decisions around the world. And the one thing that it won't be is it won't be a group that treats a city just like a big building. This is, this is one of the problems about our, our systems, that our schools or programs on, on uh, urban, uh, urban planning. Uh, y you wouldn't treat a business as being primarily a bunch of cubes and uh, office designs. You know, a business has all of these different dimensions about accountability, about incentives, about interaction, uh, innovation. And in the same way, we've got to think about those, those issues for the city. And what's, what's interesting about your focus is how much you put this, this kind of key concept uh, of equality at the heart of understanding what cities do and when they do it, when they do it well. And this is a, a, a kind of a view that I don't think is yet reflected in the academic analysis of cities, but it, 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 it should be. And it, if I'm hearing you right, I think the, the, what, what could take place here is a kind of a, a shift in the, where we draw the line, there's certain kinds of things where we expect everything to be equal, certain kinds of things where we expect things to be unequal. So one man, one vote, or one person, one vote, now, um, should be. Uh, so one person, one vote is a one extreme. The other is different people, like in Paris, will have different, different apartments. But where, where this, this line is still up for grabs is how, what's the behavior on the sidewalks? What's the behavior on the streets? Do cars get, uh, do cars get priority? And this is a really central question that ought to inform the usual analysis about technical design uh, considerations. Yes. Here in the Greenwich Village, for example, mm -hmm. you have some narrow streets. I was just one hour ago riding a bicycle on 10th Street. <laughs> they have cars parked on both sides. Who decided? I mean, the most valuable resource a city has is its road space. Yeah. The space between buildings, as Mr. Jangel calls it. Who, almost all cities in the planet, including New York, give more space to park cars mm -hmm. than to pedestrians and bicyclists. Who decided this? Because you say people should have a vote, but even children, this, this street space belongs to everybody equally. It doesn't belong anymore to people with cars. It belongs to children, to the elderly. But so whoever decided that we should give this space in this. So I think one of the most fundamental issues, even though it sounds mm -hmm. uh, simple, is how to distribute road space between pedestrians, bicyclists, public transport, and cars. And this is not a technical issue. Mm -hmm. but, but let's go back a little bit to the way you are talking about cities. When we talk about cities, for example, I work a lot in transport. And I, and I invited to some cities where there's a lot of problems. And I said, first, we have to know what kind of city we want before mm -hmm. we can provide a transport proposal, a solution. Because it's very different if what you have in mind is a city like Houston than if what you would like to have is something like Amsterdam. But even before you know what kind of city you want, Actually, you really have to know how do you want to live. Because really, a city is only a means to a way of life. A city is a means to a way of life. So actually, it, you end up, you start with transport, and it seems that the solution is going to be in the area of engineering. It's closer to religion than to engineering. Yeah. You know, what is it? What kind of life will make you happier? Yeah. Uh, and so what is wrong with our cities? So I think there are some profoundly wrong things with cities. I mean, clearly. What is wrong with our cities today? Well, the first thing is that people live in fear of getting killed. You know, this is not normal. I mean, after five, we have had cities for 5,000 years. And for 5,000 years, we had people walking in the street. Any child could go out, walk freely without any fear. But over the last 80 years, we have made cities much more for cars, mobility, and for 
people's mm -hmm. uh, happiness or well-being. You tell any three-year-old child anywhere in the planet today, watch out, a car, and the child jumps in fright, and with a good reason, because there are tens of thousands of children killed by cars every year. Mm -hmm. But the frightening thing is not that this happens, but that we think this is normal, that we should live in fear of getting killed, that this is the way life is. So now, we were talking a little bit ago. Actually, just, just as a footnote, there was an article in the New York Times today showing how incredibly low the fatality rate has become in, in air travel. So there's something very strange about our acceptance of these very high fatality rates with, with cars, but yet in air travel we have insisted yeah. on much lower fatality but, rates. But see, yeah. even if people were not killed, the fact <coughs> that you are afraid, you know, if you are yeah. with your child or your grandchild and we have a three-year-old child here in Manhattan, we are constantly worried that this child may run into the street and be killed. This is human life on Earth. This is the summum after thousands of years of human evolution. This is where we've gone. That's where we've gotten <laughs> to live in fear of getting killed. So I think this is not normal. I think, for example, I, I hope that in two or 300 years, people will say, how could people live in those horrible 2013 cities? Right. The same way we say today, how horrible it was London 1800. But at that time, London was the most admired and imitated city in the planet. So yeah. we can suggest, and later that we can suggest, what kind of, I will make some proposals of mm -hmm. what kind of new cities could be done. What is the characteristics of new cities? But before that, I'd like to remi remind you of something. Usually, we say that there is going to be a huge c urban building in the developing world. Mm -hmm. What people are not so aware is that in the United States, there will also be a huge urban building in the next 40 years. Yeah. I did a very basic estimate. I simply took the projections for population growth of the US Census Bureau. This is not some crazy uh, academic, no? This is US <laughs> Census Bureau. Plus, I projected that the size of households will be the same in the 40 years in the US, would be the same as Germany which is 2.1 or 2.2, so it's nothing very radical. Mm -hmm. And with those two, proje those two estimates, mm -hmm. you end up that in the United States you have to build over the next 40 years more than 70 million new homes. This means in the next 40 years you need to build more homes than today exist in Britain, mm -hmm. France, and Canada put together in the U.S. So now the question is, how are we going to build those homes in the U.S.? What are we going to do? Because clearly we don't know in this uh, audience, everybody agrees today that uh, we don't m want suburbs for many environmental and uh, many risks. But clearly most Americans don't want to live in Manhattan either. Mm -hmm. So what is it that we can build? Where, how is this going to be built? Yeah. Nobody's talking about this and I think this is a challenge for your university. And I yeah. would propose just a couple of details of how is it that I imagine the new city in Bogota, mm -hmm. for example, we did about, when I was mayor, we did like 70 kilometers. Bogota, by the way, is an 8 million inhabitant city, same population as New York. Of course, not New York metropolitan, I mean, there are a lot to include in Pennsylvania, but mm -hmm. just New York. And it has very high density. And we did about 70 kilometers of bicycle and pedestrian highways. Mm -hmm. I mean, so imagine a city, the new city, where you would have hundreds and even thousands of miles of pedestrian only roads where children would walk I mean let's imagine a building one side of the building is the traditional street this the behind comes out into the pedestrian only road or greenway or something like this mm -hmm. thousands of miles of so this is very easy to do I, let's imagine just this is not what I propose this, just for an Im imagine in Manhattan that in Manhattan, one avenue would be pedestrian only, the next one would be for cars, the next one pedestrian and bicycle only, and even in the pedestrian bicycle you could put buses or trams or something like this. Another thing, why not put something very easy to do, hundreds of kilometers of roads only for buses and pedestrians and bicycles, very easy, this is be a fantastic mass transit system. It would cost nothing if you design it from scratch. But now, if we begin, 
this is so easy to do mm -hmm. in the new cities that are being created, like your charter cities, yeah. or the cities that are going to be growing in, in Africa or Asia, or but even in the US. So yeah. I mean, th this is the kind of question. H how are the cities that we want? I mean, this is not something that we know. We, we, we are doing some human habitats, which clearly are not great human habitats. People are afraid of getting killed, or they are bored to death in suburbs, or so. <laughs> So how is it that we would like to do the new cities? And then the first, second. and the second question is where? Yeah. You know, cities cannot grow just where some developer decides to develop some new plot. Mm -hmm. So I believe in the US, you will need to demolish tens of thousands of acres of inner suburbs or suburbs relatively well located in order to redo them completely. Mm -hmm. I hopefully in a very different way. The problem is that in the US, Jane Jacobs, uh, beautiful and bright theories, they, they traumatize everybody. So now, uh, uh, if there are two neighbors who say hello to each other, so they say, this is a very vibrant neighborhood and you cannot, uh, <laughs> you cannot do anything. Right. But while nothing has been done over the last 50 years in the US in terms of, this is a dirty word now, urban renewal, or this, mm -hmm. we have to find a new name for it. Right. But the, the question is really, I pose to you, because you and me may be on the way out, but these young people are yeah. going to live in these cities. Going to, so my question is, where and how are these new cities to be built? Because you need 70, we just don't, we're not talking about India, we're talking mm -hmm. about the United States. 70 million new homes over the next 40 years in the United States. Yeah. So the, one of the first questions that I asked myself when I started thinking about cities like businesses was if we project forward either the 70 million in the United States or I think the number is 5 billion uh, all over the world over the next 100 years, the first question you'd ask about an, an industry is, well, are you going to accommodate that demand by expanding the size of all of the existing service providers, or do you want to have new, new entrants? And so far as I could tell, there, there really hasn't been any discussion about the relative merits of expanding existing cities versus new entrants. And in industry, we think that the new entrants are the, give you the chance to experiment. We don't know for sure what will be the most livable city. But if there were various new entrants that were reconfigured in ways that are different from the existing cities, some of those will succeed and grow rapidly, others will fail, and we could develop a, an entirely new model. And then if it's been pioneered someplace, then you can go back and try and retrofit some of the existing cities to, to be more like the, the new ones. But if we, if we lock ourselves into this perspective that you can never start a new city, you can never start a city that could grow to 10 million people, then we lose the chance to have startups, innovation, experimentation uh, that we take completely for granted in when we think of the business as the unit of analysis, but somehow we think is, is impossible for, uh, uh, for cities. Now I think, uh, again, some of the, the mistakes in Latin America may be part of why people are so close-minded about this. I mean, the first city everybody mentions if you say, well, what if, what if we started a new city? Brasilia. Is of course Brasilia. <laughs> you know. And, but and there are many relatives of Brasilia, Islamabad, yeah. Canberra, and others. Yep, yep, yep. And I think what we need to do is go back and parse what was wrong with those new cities. And my understanding, I've never been to Brasilia, but Brasilia was really designed as the perfect city for a car to live in. And it just wasn't very good for, for people. But, you know, that, that's a, you know, a, a, it wasn't a failure in the sense that nobody moved there, people moved there. But we could certainly learn from some of those failures and still ask about the other new cities that have, uh, that have succeeded. But there is a kind of a closed mentality about experimentation here that I think is, uh, is, is holding us back. And you know, one other thing that we also were just mentioning before we met is that it's very difficult for an individual to anticipate what it's like to live in a different city. When I was ready to move from Palo Alto, you know, it's the farm, it's this residential area at the New York, I came because I thought NYU was so exciting. I actually thought I was going to hate New York City. <laughs> I loved the countryside. I'd lived in Palo Alto for you know for for 20 years, um, and I've been so if I had been a voter in 
Palo Alto and you had asked me, would you vote to have a city like Manhattan? I would have said, you know, maybe for other people, but not, not in my backyard, not, not for me. But then I moved here and I, it, it turns out I, I love it. I, you know, I've been astonished at how much I, I enjoy this. And there may be other things in between that I've never experienced that I, I won't know how valuable they are until I experience them. But uh, there's, there's no way to plan or anticipate some of these things. Some of it is just going to, I think, have to emerge from some, uh, some more experimentation. Here's your ideas of uh, the charter cities. Many cities actually have tried to be created new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and have failed, because actually what makes a city succeed or exist yeah. is thousands of variables right. that make it happen. And the ones that have succeeded are, as you say, the ones that are capitals of government. So they have, uh, and even Washington was mm -hmm. one of those, yeah. or, uh, or uh, uh, and, many, uh, and several others. Yeah. But I think the, the irrationality in many developing country legislation and the mm -hmm. corruption and all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when I was mayor, I will confess, I was pressured by the World Bank to privatize the water company of Bogota. Yeah. And I had worked at the water company and I love the water company of Bogota. And I think the water company is really the most powerful tool for planning in the city and then you we have cross subsidies and we bring the water to the poorest neighborhoods very up, far up in the hills. And I think if this is in private hands, this is going to be a mess, this negotiation. And in any difficult negotiation, the government always loses. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially then it's more difficult to measure the sewage because uh, how are you going to pay for the, the sewage? I mean, they say a creek. How clean is clean? When do you pay? How much do you pay? Because besides in the same creek, maybe different levels of uh, pollution. Mm -hmm. Anyway, now, 12 years later, and after I have seen all the cheap politicking and uh, uh, how do you call this? Uh, to appoint political appointees and pa corruption pa and things, yeah. patronage. Yeah. And I say, oh, yeah. despite all the horrible problems with privatization, you have been less bad. So I think when you create a highly efficient city like you propose, mm -hmm. But there is another way to create the charter cities. It's not just out of nothing. You know, in mm -hmm. your picture, in your, in your uh, TED talk, mm -hmm. <laughs> you point at this completely barren beach in the middle of nowhere and say, here, we're going to create the city, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that it's easier to do in some already existing cities, which are very yeah. poor, almost failed cities. And they will be very happy to transform themselves into anything because they are so desperate and they are not going anywhere, I think, maybe. And still, the, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, well, but, the, but, but what I believe anyway is that I agree this may be a very interesting proposal to create new cities. Although, again, I believe there are so many millions of variables that make a city exist yeah. or not. Yeah. But what I do, what I am very worried again, is that we have a very bad urban model today. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I don't know where you would, here we have a lot of young people, most of them I'm sure don't have children. Mm -hmm. Many of them we probably will have children. How would you want to raise them? You know, if you go to a boring suburb, you know, and become a soccer mom or a soccer dad, or whatever, <laughs> uh, uh, or else you come to Manhattan and you are afraid the child is going to get run over by a car or something, you know, so. Why not imagine something where you have density, but with thousands of kilometers of pedestrian streets, something completely different, and with mix? Of, I mean, because many of these utopias have failed. Mm -hmm. It's like we are in the same. We are, you are proposing a utopia, and I am proposing a utopia in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the cynics will tell you, ah, yeah. all these utopias have failed, you know? Yeah. But clearly, what we have now is horrible. I mean, we, we are. The cities that we have now clearly are not places for happiness or civilization and for, for people to live safely. Clearly, if, human, if humanity has failed in something, it's in creating its human habitats. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'd be happy or I'd be perfectly willing to accept if, if after we ask the question, 
how much of this urban expansion should we, or this new urban population should we accommodate with new cities as opposed to expansion of existing ones? I'd be happy if the consensus turns out to be it should almost all be or entirely be expansion of existing ones, but at least we should ask the question because this, is a, this next century is really the only time in hu human history where we'd have a chance to think about yeah, see, seven, I agree. seven new cities and, in the and US, 10 million this, in the US. Yeah. Exactly. These, or, 70, or, these 70 million new, yeah. peop, new homes that are going to be built in the US, after this is done, this is yeah. going to be there for probably the next 500 years or 1,000 yeah. years. What, what is going to happen in the next yeah. 50 years is never going to happen again. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I, I've been saying to people that humans are going to live forever with the cities we leave at, at the end of 100 years. In, in, in and this is why it's so important, for example, yeah. to design, in, for example, when, when we talk about parks, if we do not save land for a, if we are able to save land for a park, one, 100 hectares or whatever, millions of people will be happier for the next 2,000 years. Yeah. If we do not save and we build over it, millions of people will be less happy because of it. So, and this is not something you can change. It's very difficult. M many things about cities, cities are very different than many things. First, mm -hmm. with cities, in the government doesn't work, the market doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, the beautiful axiom of Adam Smith that uh, each person being selfish, seeking his own, uh, mm -hmm. will, be, will yield, yield good results for society, does not work in the case of cities. You cannot let each landowner decide how high the building is, or what signs he puts, or how, how wide the sidewalks are, or you cannot allow developers to decide how wide the streets are, or, I mean, government has to decide. Yeah. And what is worrisome is that it's very subjective, because really there is no proof to say that uh, it's not I cannot prove mathematically that it's better to have a 10 meter wide sidewalk than a 2 meter wide sidewalk. Yeah. Something you feel in your soul, with your heart, especially with, your, with a child. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But clearly you cannot let the market solve these, these things. Yeah. So uh, by, the, by the way, one of the things I've learned now that I've been in New York is if you forced me to choose between a city with no parks but good sidewalks versus a city with no sidewalks but with the parks, I'll take the place with the sidewalks. Yeah, exactly. The sidewalk but is the you know, I have, I, to me, space. in my presentation, yeah. I was, um, you know, yeah. my your white hair, you have it because you are a wise professor. Uh. <laughs> my white hair, I have it because I was almost impeached yeah. Yeah. getting cars off sidewalks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was extremely difficult, and and I like to say everywhere that uh, uh, what, in terms of infrastructure, what makes a difference between an advanced and a backward city. Mm is not subways or highway, it's quality sidewalks. Yeah. I have found many African cities where even half the population doesn't even have water, but they have highways, mm -hmm. but never sidewalks. Yeah. Or in some places they have subways, but horns. So quality sidewalks are the most important element of a democratic society, and it shows respect for human dignity to have great sidewalks. Moreover, mm -hmm. bikeways mm -hmm. are protected bicycle ways, at least in the advanced cities, such as New York today, for example, mm -hmm. we accept that sidewalks are a right. Yeah. Nobody thinks sidewalks are something optional. I mean, this is a right. And if somebody were to be hit by a car in a place where there was not a sidewalk or it was closed for some reason, so I'm sure they would sue government and get a lot of money from government because they had a right to have a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Now I ask, is a protected bicycle way a cute architectural feature, mm -hmm. or is it a right? Yeah. I would say it is as much a right as a protected, as a sidewalk, because first of all, it's the only possible means of individual mobility in developing countries for 80% of the population, but even in countries like this for a 12-year-old or for a 13-year-old. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I agree, and, and I w when I was in beach, I'll tell you a story. People, of course, would tell me, Mayor, you are so stubborn. So, uh, not to say other things, just to put it <laughs> lightly. <laughs> and uh, because there is enough space in the sidewalk to make parking bays as well as for people to walk by, you know? Yeah. So we had a TV advertisement saying, look, we tend to think that sidewalks are relatives of streets because they live next to each other. But actually, sidewalks different from streets are not for getting from one place to another. They can be useful for that, but they are for talking, for playing, for kissing. They really are much closer relatives of parks or plazas than they are of streets. 
And to say that in a sidewalk there is enough space to uh, carve out parking bays as well as for people to walk by is equivalent to saying that you can turn the main park or the main plaza in a city into an opener parking lot <laughs> so long as you leave enough space between cars for people to walk by. Yeah. Yeah. But this is not a discussion for Mumbai or Bogota. Yeah. This is a discussion for Greenwich Village again. You know, we come back again. Yeah. Who decided that we are going to leave all this space for these cars to be parked? Who? This, did anybody vote? For example, there was a big discussion uh, because um, Miss Janet, Janet Sadik Khan tried to put a bikeway in Park Slope and all of this. I mean, and people here, you know. Yeah. To whom does this belong? To who decides on this? I mean, this is a... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the conversation we had a little bit before and today has made me look at New York City differently. One of the striking things coming from California to New York is how different the behavior is about pedestrians vis-a-vis -vis cars. In California, there's still a legacy of this. Pedestrians have to follow the, the rules. If they walk against the sign, they can get ticketed, and you don't, you don't do it. It's like, it's like parts of you know, Europe, Germany, where it's just people will scold you if you walk against the sign. I, New York is, of course, very different. When I first came here, I interpreted this partly as just, well, this is a, two different examples of equilibria that can be reinforcing if everybody crosses against the light, everybody will tend to do that. If they don't, they don't tend to do it. But, but talking with you has made me realize that there's something else going on here. It's not just a random outcome that people behave differently here. There's, there's partly an assertion of ownership of the city by the pedestrians. There's something almost aggressive vis-a-vis -vis the cars. And the fact that everybody does that changes the power structure so that any car that drives in this city has to be very careful to watch for all the, the pedestrians, and it, that really the burden is on the drivers to make sure that they don't, they don't hit someone. So it's a completely different experience to drive here. And so when somebody like Giuliani, Giuliani apparently was trying to get the police to enforce the, the rules about pedestrians not crossing against the light, there was this backlash that meant that they, they just had to back off on this. And I think it was uh, not just about logistics and efficiency of transport, but it was this fundamental political kind of issue of who owns this city, the, the, the pedestrians or the, or, or the cars. And somehow New York got to that point, but in most of the, most of the world, as you say, the presumption is, is that the cars have the rights. And uh, yeah. but then the question is and how this do you And this is even worse, you, you know, the whole, the whole yeah. I mean, in here in New York, I believe, you know, this is a big problem with these vendors who are taking all over the yeah. sidewalks. This yeah. is Manhattan, they, I think they are buying to be a third world city. You know, yeah. and it's very funny how classic this is because in defensive streets they don't allow vendors. You know, like in Madison Avenue, I mm -hmm. wonder if there is a vendor in front of Mr. Uh, 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 the mayor's, uh, uh, Mr. Yeah. Bloomberg's uh, yeah. apartment. I yeah. I would doubt it that they have some vendors in front of that apartment. Yeah. And of course, this sounds very cute and nice, but actually, uh, when New Yorkers want a nice pedestrian space, they control vendors very much. As I seen. The upper income people like this, like Central Park, they are extremely controlled. Yeah. Or they go to Hudson River Park, extremely controlled. Yeah. Riverside Park, extremely controlled. The High Line, extremely controlled. Sidewalks downtown, <laughs> no, and now everywhere, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I think this is very dangerous because uh, this is sacred. But now, when you talk about developing countries, I mean, we, we are talking about a different, moreover, at the intersections, Sidewalk should continue at grade, mm -hmm. so that it's cars that have to go up and down. So it is clear that it's cars that are entering pedestrian space mm -hmm. and not vice versa. Uh, and in developing countries, almost by definition, a developing country is one where le in a developing country city is one where less than 50 percent of people own cars. So most people have to walk. And so you need to give priority to public transport, to bicycles, to pedestrians, but uh, of course you don't. Uh, this is, uh, again, equality. Everything is equality. <laughs> so, so let me come back on this, this issue of experimenting with new cities. <clears throat> um, one point where I think I, I would disagree is the fact that lots of cities fail 
I think should no more dissuade us than the fact that lots of startup firms fail as well. That as long as the, the costs of the new cities aren't very high, if you realize their failure early on and then you let them, you let them die, I think it makes as much sense to try lots of different cities and accept that only a few will succeed, but the few that succeed will be so valuable that be an it's, well, it's well, worth, uh, well worth doing. And the, the ones that I think are most interesting are ones like uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and really all of Pennsylvania. This is why I called it a charter, charter city, because Penn's charter. Penn went and said he was going to create this city that nobody believed was, was possible, one where the state didn't determine what type of religion people worshipped. I think most people thought that was either just you know, blasphemy or, and or extremely dangerous. It could, it could never work. But Penn recruited people to come live in this new city, and it worked. And the people who came there reinforced this new norm, and this changed everybody's conception of what a you know what a city or a political jurisdiction could could be like. So I think uh, that's the yeah. kind of experimentation where, in advance, if you'd asked all of the academics of the era, could you have a separation of church and state, they would have told you it would never it would never succeed or people would never want it. But in fact, somebody experimented with it and it and it it took off and changed. North America and you know perhaps uh, the, the world. So yeah, I agree. That's I mean, the, the, the I believe the innovation you, your ideas are especially value relative to efficiency and market regulation. But what I what I don't think is necessarily it seems to me it's not necessary that these cities are in the middle of nowhere. They could be right next in the in a, in, yeah. a, in a suburb of a city right. or almost downtown too. If right. you take two hundred hectares or one two thousand hectares, why why right. does it have to be far? You know, but and you could but create. That, but then that goes back to this practical question you were alluding to before about the problems with with private land. Well, but if and, government and is really interested, in, I mean, the most difficult thing about creating a charter city mm -hmm. is to get through Congress in a country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's approve an area where all the laws of this country are not going to apply <laughs> or very few well, or I mean but I mean or some of the laws whatever yeah I mean regardless it's difficult yeah. Yeah. so once you have you have this political clout maybe the easiest thing to do mm -hmm. to buy 2,000 hectares is nothing mm -hmm. you know it's uh, the issue if you are if you're really willing to try it yeah. but anyway this is uh, uh, but but this, I mean this, this issue of the, the land market, uh, I think you agree with me more than you realize, because this issue with the land market is a huge impediment. And when you have built up areas and then empty land adjacent to it, the value uh, of the land has already gone up, and it's impossible to ever re re recapture that. So you've lost this potential for financing everything you want to do. So even here in the United States, suppose we don't want to reform anything. We just love everything about the United States. You could still think about starting a new city where you start with, say, the, the government that's going to make all of the investments that makes that land valuable. Start with it owning all of the land. Have a city where nobody makes a windfall gain, no private individual makes a windfall gain on real estate speculation. That would give you a completely different model of public finance. Yeah, and, actually, and it's something you could never do adjacent to an existing city. But there's all kinds of empty land where you could go, go try it. Well, yeah. It depends on each case in each city. For example, in Bogota, in Colombia, it's amazing. Yeah. In Colombia, Colombia, again, as I mentioned to you, is, a, is an interesting case because Colombia is a country with many cities, not on the coast, but all over. Some on the coast, but mm -hmm. some we have uh, Atlantic and uh, Pacific, and they are all over. Uh, and still, I have estimated that with only $3 billion, you would be able to buy all the land in around all cities in Bogota that you would need to control and regulate. Because you don't have to buy all the land. If you are, if you only, we actually, we did a project like this. We, we, di we created a, a company, a land reform company. <laughs> we bought land voluntarily or through eminent domain. Because by the way, this is, in, when we are talking about, when we are going to do a highway in the United States, mm -hmm. no, for example, from New York to Boston, we do the shortest way from point A to point B, because if you have one turn too much, this will cost hundreds of millions of dollars for all the trucks going around this turn that would, could be, have been avoided. 
Now, if you're going to create a city where millions are going to, or maybe hundreds of thousands, which will generate not a few thousand truck trips, but millions of trips a day, a city must grow not where some developer like, would like it to grow, but in the optimum location. This, and so if, when you're going to do a road, you use eminent domain mm -hmm. to do the road where it should be. So in the same way, you have to use eminent domain to have the US cities grow where they should. This is a matter almost of survival to the world because of global warming and all this. If the cities grow in the wrong places, this generates a lot of energy consumption. And uh, this is a matter of almost of survival for humanity. So this is more than justification to use eminent domain. So we created this development. And uh, we, we cannot go into the details. It's done by the private, the rest. But but, but what is, I say, as, what as all, as I'm mayor, saying, all I'm as, saying, all I'm saying is that after, after when after I was mayor, when so I was mayor. mayor. Okay, so you. But but what yeah. I'm saying is that in Colombia, with three billion dollars, which is peanuts, I mean, it's what mm -hmm. it would cost a 20 kilometer subway. Yeah. Not in New York prices, because here in New York, the two miles for uh, for uh, the Second Avenue subway cost three billion dollars. Yeah. Uh, uh, but even in international prices for 20 kilometers, mm -hmm. so peanuts. This is nothing. So, yeah. but each country, this is not the issue. I mean, the, the thing yeah. is that what I what I, I, what I think we should uh, mm -hmm. we should really agree is that the cities we have been doing mm -hmm. are extremely wrong. Let me tell you another issue. What, when I talk about Latin America and Asia, what does it mean? Today, India is around forty percent urban. China is about fifty-five percent urban. Right today. So in the transition in Latin America between 40% urban and 75 or 80% urban, the population of the main cities increased by more than 1,000%. Mm -hmm. This in China will not happen because of the one-child policy and all this, but it will happen in Indonesia and it will happen in China. There is no reason why these cities are not going to explode. So how are these cities going to be? And if we have private land around these cities, you are going to force millions, millions into slums. As you were saying before, much more important yeah. than uh, the size of the low-income housing is the location and the public space around it. Yeah. And uh, I think we're going to uh, head in straight to a catastrophe in Asian countries, even today in Colombia. This is something that is not realized. Latin American cities are still going to grow about 300% over the next 40 years or 50. Not so much because population growth, but because there is a deficit existing, but mostly because homes are going to be smaller, the same as in the US. They're getting mm -hmm. small, but more so in Latin America. And so, I mean, the challenge is amazing. What I, what I cry and I, 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 I I have gone into politics because try to do something about it, is that humanity is missing an opportunity to create much happier lives. Yeah. We could very cheaply, very easily, with a totally different urban design, make much better cities, which would create much more equality, much more happiness. Mm -hmm. They would have much more green, they would be much more pedestrian friendly. And we are missing an opportunity that would cost very little, mm -hmm. very little. I mean, relatively, in Colombia, as I mentioned, just to do this whole ur re urban, control urban land, it would cost basically $3 billion, nothing. Yeah. And I if you complement this with the chartered con system, we are creating paradise. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you know, I think part of what animates us is a kind of a theory of, of, of government. And I think part of what drives me is, is this pessimism about the potential for having governments that are strong enough to even take advantage of something like eminent domain. If you think back to, say, Hausmann, you know, bulldozing parts of Paris, I don't think any government anywhere in the world will ever be able to do to a city what, what, what Hausmann did. Then when you read the story of New York, when uh, they made the, the grid the plan for the grid in 1811. The state appointed a set of commissioners who defined the grid, used eminent domain to take the land from the private landowners for the streets. 
and forced the landowners, at no compensation, and forced the landowners to pay for the construction of the streets as they built them from about Greenwich Village up to 155th Street. And I can't imagine any government in the United States being that strong and doing something, which in the end turned out to be very beneficial to all the landowners. They got huge gains from having these, these streets that turned their farmland into uh, to developable urban land. But I'm, I'm really pessimistic about the ability of governments to do what's in the interests of the, the entire community and that we may be able to do that only in places where we start fresh, where there aren't as many people who have a sense of entitlement and uh, are willing to oppose what, you know, what one, is, one is doing. It's the, it's the clean spaces where we might actually be able to have a government that's strong enough to do the things governments sh actually need to do. And, it, and in this sense, I think the whole pendulum of the 20th century of asserting that the biggest problem when we think about the nation is governments that are too strong. You know, it's totalitarian, authoritarian rule. But this I is the problem. The this thing is we're the problem. realize in this century is, is that the city governments are too weak to do the basic things that we want to create the, the kind of living uh, style, the lifestyle that we want. Well, some eminent domain was used much more recently than when they made the street grid in New York. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moses mm -hmm. demolished the homes for more than 500,000 people in 1950s and 60s. 40s, 50s, and uh, regardless of whether one thing this is right or wrong, actually the yeah. housing that he did for low-income housing is still yeah. stands quite well. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think it's very dangerous what you just said. That that uh, the, I think one of the dangers in our time mm -hmm. is that we have decided that government is inefficient, is abusive, is corrupt, and so that now the market is beautiful and the market everything that is private works wonderful and uh, and so i think in the in you can say and i believe in the market as well yeah. uh, but i think in cities cities you need government you need government you cannot let this to private decisions how wide the streets are or where you have parks or not or what the heights of buildings are or what the, the, the design of signage are. Uh, this is public space. Public space belongs to all of us by definition. For example, here in Manhattan, you see this horrible McDonald's sign here in Broadway, mm -hmm. near here, you know? It's mm -hmm. horrible. Mm -hmm. It deteriorates. I mean, they are not using their own private space. They are using public space. They are lowering the values and degenerating. So isn't it possible that society can vote to regulate how signs can be put? Like, uh, so. But anyway, uh, but, but I mean, I even, even at this most basic level, just mobility and interaction, which is what we want in cities. If you look at a city like Bangkok, where the roads developed in this piecemeal fashion without any attention to how they would fit together, they've created through this uncoordinated process a, a, a street grid which is, is impossible to support any kind of a bus system. And so it's, it's, it's going to be impossible to solve the congestion problems in, in Bangkok. But I fear that it's also... Not impossible. I believe that if, if you were to use, of course, it's some very narrow streets and all this, but basically, if you were to give priority to buses in all streets, yeah. you solve... I mean, buses are the only solution, it, and it, they are very easy solution. The problem is political, because the upper income people have cars, Yep. And the upper income people want subways very much. The most ardent defendants of subways in developing countries are upper income people. Not because they have the slightest intention of ever using one, right, right. but because they want to put the rest of the people, preferably underground, yeah. where though they don't have to see them, you know, and they dream that this is going to solve uh, yeah. traffic jams, which of course it does. And in Bangkok, you see the, uh, the elevated subway and the jam right below it. Uh, but, but in Bangkok, you know, we, we, Sully Angel, who's, who's worked with us here in the Urbanization Project, lived in Bangkok and has showed me this, that the arterial roads are too far apart. So even if you dedicated them entirely to buses, you'd have res residences where you're four kilometers away or three yeah, kilometers okay. away from a bus I line. don't know enough about so, Bangkok. So they'll, you know, and, and that they won't solve unless somebody like Hausman says, we're going to create a new arterial where the bus can go. Oh, but I now remember what I wanted to tell you. Yeah. 
the challenge is the following. You, the challenge of the uh, universities, the challenge is the following. First of all, I think some areas in the US, inner suburbs, are totally collapsed, dead. Because some are very dynamic, like the ones you have around Man New York or something. But for example, you go around Baltimore. I was in Birmingham. Birmingham has a very dynamic University of Alabama downtown. About where many fancy professors and doctors and all this work and research and things. And two miles away is a totally collapsed suburbs. Boarded schools. Houses crumbling. Uh, hundreds of acres of this right around. And so the professors go drive very far for 30 minutes or 40 to their homes very far. And where you could do a fantastic city. So you don't use eminent domain even for this totally collapsing. Why? Because here in the United States now, it became a dirty word to use to do some urban redevelopment or urban renewal or whatever. It became Jane Jacobs really traumatized everybody. Now nobody dares to do anything. But while the United States sleeps or, or lies in panic, mm -hmm. Europe has done dozens or hundreds of or urban re redevelopment projects in the neighborhood where I live in Paris, in the center of Paris. Mm -hmm. They completely demolished about maybe 100 acres right there near Montparnasse. Mm -hmm. And they really have fantastically successful project, you know? And in Spain, they have done many. So in England, they just did one for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in Europe, all over the place. So I think the United States will have, but the challenge for the United States is the following. Mm -hmm. What I would say is, you have to educate the people. First, of what the growth is going to be in American cities. How many homes you have to build in the United States? Because I think people are not conscious of the, people think China is going to grow a lot and India, but no, here in the United States, yeah. no? And not only that, in, some, in the best areas in terms of environmental uh, global warming, where, where you need the least heating, uh, such as Palo Alto and all of these places, you don't have people, this not growing very much as, well, California is growing, but not so much in this area of San Francisco. But the area where you need huge heating and big houses, you know, such as Houston, is <laughs> exploding. So you also have to educate the people what the cost in terms of quality of life, mm -hmm. of economics, of environment, of having a different. So people don't understand what the else. Do you really think the typical, I mean, nobody really, the typical American, I mean, nobody almost, not the typical, the typical or non-typical knows where there is an alternative, a different kind of human habitat which could exist with a lot of green, with high density, but with a lot of green. For example, here we have some nice development, which is a little bit of an example of what I would imagine, like Battery Park City. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of green, high, high density, uh, but this, instead of water, in the other side also could have parks. And, uh, so. Before we know whether it is possible to use eminent domain or not, we have to know why would we use eminent domain? What is the cost? What is it that we want to do as cities? Mm -hmm. Why would we need to do eminent domain? Why do people accept gladly to use eminent domain where they are going to do an airport? Nobody questions in the United States. Not only that. Oh. I mean, oh, but I mean, of it's course, getting, there is, the typical, harder harder, there is the typical discussion, of course. And, you know, yeah. But even, even the Supreme Court, even when they yeah. did the famous ruling in New London, Connecticut, for the Supreme Court of the United States, it was like in 2007 or something like yeah. this. Yeah. And this was a very interesting use of eminent domain because it was use of eminent domain not for a road, not for an airport, not for a port, but for urban redevelopment. Right. And it was approved by the United States Supreme Court. And of course, the, the, the right doesn't like uh, yeah. to use this. Yeah. But this is a legitimate discussion. But before we know whether we should use eminent domain or not, people understand clearly why a road is needed. Yeah. They do not understand why a different kind of city in a different kind of place is needed. I don't think people understand why. what is the cost of that. Yeah. Well, just to conclude this part of the discussion, if you take the, this shift from an entitlement from the perspective of the car owners 
to a sense of entitlement on the part of the individuals, the pedestrians uh, who, who live in a city, who walk in a city. Uh, my pessimism suggests that the best way to create a city with that different notion of entitlement would be to start someplace new, that that would be easier than to go change an existing city. But on the other hand, we have seen, and, and this is because people's sense of entitlement is so strong that they'll go to the barricades, they'll be ready to just fight vociferously to oppose any change. But yet we have seen some big changes in, in entitlement that are, I think, hard to understand. It, it used to be that, you know, when, when we were young, the smoker had an entitlement to smoke a cigarette and others didn't have the right to object. People would think you were crazy if you asked somebody else to, to, to not smoke. And then over time, partly because of, I think, evidence about secondhand smoke and agitation, some government in involvement, we've completely shifted the notions of entitlement about the smoker versus the, the non-smoker. So it, it's not as though all change, all social change has to come from like the new, the, the new Pennsylvania, but my, my theory is you probably want to push on both, uh, mm. on both paths because change is, is, is pretty hard to get. Yeah. I don't object that you try to do a charter city in the middle of the nowhere, yeah. but I think it's easier, maybe more useful. You know, most developing country cities, most developing, even Latin American cities, which are already urbanized, yeah. will, Bogota, for example, I would say will occupy at least three times the land that it w has now. Yeah. So it now has about 40,000 hectares. Mm -hmm. So it will need about 80,000 hectares and still have a very high density. Yeah. So to be able to separate right there 10,000 sure. hectares for your city yeah. may be much more easy. And the same will happen in Bangkok. Yeah. And the same will happen in uh, in uh, Ahmedabad, sure. and the same will happen in Nairobi. So this is n I don't think this is yeah. the most important part so of the discussion. Yeah. Uh, I agree with both, yeah. I, but I think yeah. it may be easier yeah. to do it. Sure. We're already a city is going to grow, but sure. this is well, I don't think this is the most important. I mean, just part. to be clear, the, the urbanization project is has two wings. One is the new city wing, which I think we at least should or initiative. I think we should at least be considering. But we, we understand fully that the vast majority of the new space in urban areas is going to be created through expansion of existing cities. So that hopefully that not in the United expansion. States. Yeah. <laughs> well, but that, that urban expansion initiative, which is takes motivation more from say New York City's expansion with the, the grid, is numerically the more the more important. But the innovative startup kind of dimension may be a little bit more important for letting us explore the things that don't exist now that could exist that we discover through trial and error create a truly better uh, quality of life so let me take some some questions from the uh, from from the audience so the, the the first one was what would you do if you were mayor of New York parentheses and will you please run for mayor of New York <laughs> I'm looking for the really tough, you know, the tough no, questions uh, here. So. Well, you know, I would just, I think everybody agrees today, basically, that we are trying to create more humane cities. I think what has been done over the last few years with uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Janet Sadiq Khan is interesting. I don't like this non-protected bicycle ways. I think a bicycle way, which is not a safe, is not safe for an eight-year-old, is not a bike way, you know? It's, you have to have physically protected bicycle ways, not just painted lanes in this, this street. I think if it would be a wonderful challenge to have what they did, I mean, for example, even what they did in Broadway, you don't really have a wonderful, wide, nice, safe, Mm -hmm. Bike, we going all the way from uptown to downtown, from from the from uh, Harlem to downtown. You don't have one, and you don't have cross cross town protected bicycle. So I think there is a huge room here to to begin to get rid of parked cars. And one thing that is important to remember, I like to remind of this following thing. 
Constitutions have many rights, especially developing country rights. You find right to everything, you know, you have a right to war, to health, to education, to many other things. But I have never found a constitution where parking is a constitutional right. Parking <laughs> is not included in any constitution. So, uh, so that would be a first step. I would dream of a New York where we would take a lot more space away from parked cars and give it to wider sidewalks and bike protected bicycle ways. That would be one. Of course, they have advanced a lot, and I congratulate what has been done. It's wonderful. So let me give you another. How do, how do we fight against bus stigma in the US? Yes, this is wonderful. Uh, all over the US, they love trams. They are so sexy trams, you know? <laughs> uh, in 1940, there were trams. Every city with more than 100,000 inhabitants all over the world and trams were seen as a poor transport for the poor. Uh, uh, for, for and, and so when buses appeared, in a matter of five or 10 years, trams disappeared. And it's not because of this legend that General Motors bought a few tram system yeah, and yeah. scrapped, and this is irrelevant. I mean, it's because trams had an image of being for the poor and buses were sexy. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, in 1910, wh one of the reasons is interesting. In 1910, all streets in the world were still made like they were made 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire, with cobblestone, like this, like the nice, cute uh, Soho mm -hmm. cobblestone street. So, yeah. but the pneumatic tires for heavy vehicles had not been invented. They were not uh, so. The, uh, imagine a, a solid rubber uh, in a. It was not possible. So really, you only had buses, as we know them today, only late late 1930s. But anyway, so today in the uh, in the United States cities, uh, when they want you, buses are for the Colombians and the Mexicans and the African Americans. And so, if you want BMW driving yuppies to use public transport, you need to give them trams. That's sexy, you know. Uh, I think you need uh, sexy buses. Wonderful architecture, <laughs> yes. Wonderful design. You they design some nice buses, some beautiful buses. Nice architecture, because buses actually do more than trams at a lower cost. The only way to really go with public transport all over the city is with buses with in exclusive lanes. But really, it's unfortunate that you, the New York, despite that they made some improved select service bus on this, they really don't have a top quality BRT. The U.S. has a one good BRT. Uh, in uh, Cleveland, mm -hmm. but but I think buses buses are machines that are totally on the, our BRT in Bogota. Even though it has many problems and whatever, but it's still moving more passengers our direction than all subways in the world, except for four or five, including more passengers our direction than the New York subway, the highest, the most congested subway line in New York is the the, the green one which moves about 51,000 passengers our direction, mm -hmm. including the two, the express and the, and the regular. So it costs twice as much. Uh, our BRT is moving 47,000 passengers our direction, and it could be much better. Now Rio is doing some fantastic BRTs for the Olympics and the World Cup. But clearly, it's crucial. I mean, buses, unfortunately, are not very sexy, as they say, it's totally right. We have to make them sexy with nice stations, with a lot of electronics that people know a lot of things. But because the only way to solve public transport in the developing world, in particular, because the US may, may, may like and they may do some cute tram, they have the money to do it. By the way, the, I mentioned that our capacity for our BRT is 47,000 passengers our direction. Even the highest capacity tram in the United States, in, the, in Portland, or Denver is not even going up to 3,500, not even to 4,000 passengers our direction. It's almost a toy. Right, right. So here, here's another question. Is, is one of the reasons for inequality in developing societies the special interest lobbies uh, that are powerful and represent the interests of the, the rich persons and corporations, and should they be illegal? I'm not sure if that means corporations or the, or the lobbies. But let me, let me add my own spin on that. If you thought about governance of some political entity 
you could think about relying much more heavily on a legislative body or much more heavily on an executive or some balance of the two. And so either regulating, uh, making illegal the actions of the lobbies or adjusting the balance between an executive and the legislature, what's the best way to get a political system that this reflects is, this the This is profound the philosophy. <laughs> well, it's, it's not this philosophy, it's practical. Yeah, I know, but the problem is uh, the following. Yeah. In, the, in the advanced societies, you know, politics, I am a very bad politician. I lose elections all the time <laughs> because I say what I think. This is very stupid, you know. Yeah. There is modern technologies. They have polls. You have to say what the polls tell you to say. And so the problem is that more and more all politicians from all parties say what the polls want them to, to mm -hmm. say and in the end they all say the same. So most new ideas are coming in the United States from NGOs. Many NGOs often supported by uh, private interest, uh, but re really new ideas are never born with majority support. Always it occurs to one person, the charter man here, yeah, mm -hmm. he fights and blah, 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 you know, it's, and then maybe he gets a few, but wants to get a majority for them. So, but at some point, some politician has to take some risk. Uh, and I think there will always be lobbies and all this, but, but what I think is important is that people to organize. For example, regardless of, of uh, lobbies and regardless of uh, NGOs, mm -hmm. for example, we we're talking about how to distribute road space. Here we had this war, I mean, a huge battle for the Park Slope bikeway. So how to distribute road space? This is perhaps the most important battle in urban, in urban trends for a long time, even before. So how are we going to win to get rid of the parking cars? Because the parked cars have a very powerful people defending them, even though it's a very small minority of people in Manhattan. It's a very small minority, nothing. And still they are able to win and to keep this, uh, you know? So I think the people who want more space for pedestrians or for bicycles have to organize themselves and create political pressure. This is a political battle. And political battles are won not because they are more intelligent. The ones who win in politics is not the more intelligent and the, or the more just. It's the one that has the most capacity to pressure elected people. So I think the, anybody who wants to change the world will have to participate in that dirty thing which is called politics somehow. Because finally, decisions are made there. But, but on this issue of legislative versus executive, there is this big oh, trend towards the kind of the strong mayor is a sense that this is a better way to govern a city. Is that, is that something you'd endorse or? You know, the problem, great a strong mayor is wonderful and you have a good mayor. And terrible when you have a bad mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, what is true is the following. Very democrat, I will say something terrible, not politically correct. Mm -hmm. I was able to do huge changes, radical changes. I made 300 kilometers of protected bikeways when there was not one kilometer on, in New York or London or Paris or Madrid. Yeah. Uh, because we had a I had a lot of power as mayor. Uh, when I see the very, of course, that's not the best way for change to happen. Mm -hmm. The best way for change to happen is in a more democratic way, but it's very difficult to convince a majority because, first of all, people are always naturally, instinctively against change. You know, when I was manager of the uh, vice president of the Bogota Water Company, I was one of the first who said, no more typewriters, let's bring computers. And I brought everybody to computing class and all these secretaries, everywhere. They were all so happy. They went to two weeks of lessons for computers where they had their personal computer there. And they would put a flower pot on top of the computer and continue to use the typewriter, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so uh, change is always difficult. Change is always difficult. Plus, sometimes people are affected by change. The people who are going to get their cars off the park, they are, they are they tend to organize themselves very well. So when I see very democratic societies, such as New England, mm -hmm. small towns in New England or Switzerland, where everything, everybody participates very much, that's beautiful and that's wonderful, but 
in fact, it's very difficult to change anything in those societies because to achieve a majority there, it's easier to get some crazy person in government that will take the risk than to convince a majority. These societies, which initially were the example to the world, they become extremely conservative, and it's very difficult to change anything in those societies. So I don't know what to do. Of course, the correct, the politically correct thing to say is, ideally, it's a huge participation. We vote on everything. But in fact, in order to change, and in developing countries, it's worse, mm -hmm. because the low-income people are very easily manipulated by powerful interests. Developing countries like California. I, I lived in a place where we decided things with referenda, and it, trust me, it doesn't turn out so well. Uh, let's, that uh, let's is the right thing to do, but it's difficult, yes. Well, it, it may I not, don't know. It's it difficult. May not, <laughs> may not always be right. Uh, one final quick uh, upbeat question. So what's the important role, or what, how important is technology in the development of cities? I'll, I'll take part of this and then leave you with the final word. Um, when I look around the developing world, I think one of the most important things a brand new city could do is ban solid fuels and ban liquid fuels. This is the kind of regulation you could enforce in many parts of the world. You can't replicate the entire regulatory structure of the LA basin, which is one way to get clean air, but with the technology which is going to drive down the price of natural gas all over the world, you could have the cleanest air in the developing world if you simply prohibited any of those buses from burning diesel, let any car burn gasoline, uh, let any electrical plant burn, uh, burn coal. So I think the falling price of natural gas could create an enormous opportunity for providing cleaner air around the world. But look, what at this time, technologies excite you? Look, at this time, we have so much. We, I am back to the very basics, to get the land in the right places, to build the cities in the right place, to save some big mm -hmm. places for parks. Mm -hmm. We have so much poverty. Look, Bogota, we have more than a million people without pavement in front of their homes. Maybe 400,000 children who walk in the mud every day to school. Mm -hmm. So when you tell me natural gas or electric, whatever, look, I'll tell you, look, for now, the difficult political battle is to give priority in road space to buses. Later, we, and then of course, we have to use the cheapest fuel. I mean, if it's gas, wonderful. If it's uh, whatever, at this moment. Later, it's very, once we have achieved this, it's very easy later to change the technology. Once you are able to get cars off a lane, that's the difficult battle. Then we can change to batteries or to whatever. So now, when you tell me technology, technology has, again, fantastic potential. Um, what you can do with cell phones and computers, I have seen uh, even in the poorest slums in Bogota, I see people with computers and uh, I saw the last, only two weeks ago, I saw, I saw a lot of, a bunch of children in a very poor neighborhood sitting in the streets and sidewalks there with the computers, you know, and I said, what is it? well, it turned out that it was next to the school where they had Wi-Fi, yeah. and so they go to the street, there. but for example, English is more important than, I mean, computers without English, internet without English is maybe 5% as useful because it may be good to go chat with your friends or, but, uh, but I do believe that we are in a world with the new technology are doing amazing things that are changing, uh, even for bicycling, I mean, for example, now, electrically aided bicycles two i think two things have changed bicycling to altogether one is electrically aided bicycles which allow people which are not in very good shape to go f use bicycles or in uh, cities where are very spread out if you have protected bike with even somewhat suburban you could ride or even with cities with hills and ipods I know some people think it's dangerous to use iPod riding a bicycle. I think it's fantastic to ride a bicycle listening to yeah. listening to an iPod is like flying through life, you know. I just you know. so uh, uh, I think the things that have been happening with technology are amazing. And these young people don't realize when you is how amazing how the world has changed. In so even in my life, I am not still a, a dinosaur almost, but not yet. <laughs> Uh, and when I was a, a child, there were not computers, there were not even jet planes, uh, there were not cell phones, there were no electronic cameras. So 
it's amazing. So I don't know, but everything to me seems that it's all for the better. I, don't, I only think the world is going to be much, much better. I don't know exactly how, but it seems that it's much more better, much more fun, and uh, technology is doing a wonderful job. Well, <laughs> I, I, I congratulate you on surviving a career in politics and retaining some sense of optimism. That's, a, that's an achievement. Especially after losing so many elections. Right. So <laughs> join me in thanking Thank uh, the mayor.